because we don't even know that. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we'll take a look at where we're at, where we're headed. Um, the, so what we've got up is the on-campus um, syllabus. The online, I think, is very similar. There might be just a couple of slight tweaks in it, but um, for the online students that are, that are watching the recording, they'll need to make sure they look at their syllabus and their schedule. Um, so we were just talking about before we turned it on that we have an exam coming up a week from Thursday, and so we're going to finish up Chapter 3 this week. And so basically what we're going to do is take those building blocks that we worked on last week and and add a little bit of complexity to that. And it, it's when I say a little bit, I mean we're just going to add a little at a time, so it shouldn't shouldn't seem too overwhelming. Um, so 3B uh, is what we'll cover today, the second lecture in Chapter 3, and then on Thursday we'll cover the third lecture in Chapter 3. We'll come in next Tuesday and do an exam review, which will probably not take the entire class period. And then I'll turn you loose and, and we'll come back and take the exam then on that Thursday. Okay. Then when we come back after the exam, how I have revised the class since previous semesters is we're going to have two project work days right after the exam. And the first project work day, um, we're going, to, you're, we're going to come in and I'm going to take a previous semester's project and I'm going to walk you through how they did part A of that project, mm -hmm. right? And then on Thursday, <coughs> what I would expect is for you to come back and be working on your own project and asking questions about how, you, how that should go on that Thursday, okay? And then that project would be due then the following Monday, all right? And I thought we've got time today to take a look at a couple of previous projects, and so I'm going to go ahead and walk you through um, a little bit. Be aware, though, that the project, I've broken it up into basically four parts, um, and that's an extra part versus what was in previous semesters as well. Because when we got to part C and D used to be combined, and it just seemed like, um, we kind of lost our way. Some students lost their way when we got to that part. So I thought, well, we'll just chunk it down into something just a little bit smaller. I took out a chapter from an, um, we used to do a, a chapter on project management in here and that was from another textbook and it just seems like just a little bit too much going on. So I went ahead and pulled that out. Um, so that being said, I want to go ahead and start with um, kind of a look at the projects, okay? And so um, I've got open a bunch of documents here, so let me, so your first thing that you need to do is um, identify what your, proce what, your pro what your project is going to be, what process you're going to look at, right? Um, and so you just need to give me a verbal description of it, um, do a very high level initial diagram, you know, it doesn't have to be anything very specific in terms of you need to get the key things in there, um, but I'm not grading it for detail at this point. I just want to make sure that you've thought about it enough to have an idea of what that looks like. Um, one of the requirements is that it be a nonlinear process, and so we're going to talk about a linear process today and a nonlinear process on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that you're making that distinction. It's got to have at least some complexity in it to show that it's just not a straight line process. Okay. Um, and you're going to want something that has both operational steps and some waiting time. Um, and then I want you to tell me why you selected that. And I would assume it's going to be because there's some problem, perceived problem with the process as it currently exists. Okay. Um, as we go throughout the semester, <coughs> some of the verbiage is um, t tell me about what your client. Okay. So Blake, if you were going to do one for the company that has the the uh, what was the type of equipment again? It's conveyor mining equipment. Yeah, so if you were going to do, so that company would be your client, right? It's, it's basically mm -hmm. if you were doing a consulting work, who would you be reporting to, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we think about um, how we present things, we do it differently, okay? This project has two parts to it. One is you're creating a paper, and the paper is for me. And the paper is so that you tell know me, here's this, and here's how I did it, and here's what the assumptions are. And I should be able to read that paper, see the numbers that you've captured, understand the assumptions behind it, and agree with your calculations. Okay? If you're reporting to a client, right, they don't want all that information. They assume you know what you're doing. Okay? And so on the on the client side, when you do, so it's as we approach the end of the semester, and I, I, we can look, I think maybe I broke it up where you do kind of a, a paper for me and then a PowerPoint for your client. 
you're going to be trying to summarize the key points that you found. And you're going to try to get rid of the technologic, not the technological, the technical speak, right? And put it in terms that your client understands. And those are two very different things. And I, and I intentionally create that because um, when we've had students do um, projects with, say, the <coughs> bookstore or the financial aid office, inevitably their first PowerPoint presentation is a summary of the technical things that they've done. And that just makes those people blaze over, right? They're like, oh, you know. And so what they want to know is, here's where we found the problem. Here's what we think you can, you know, so, so it's a very different type of presentation. So the paper is for me to be able to assess your accuracy and your calculations and your assumptions. And your presentation is for your client to show that how you would communicate with someone regarding your findings, OK? So, um, and again, it's important that you keep in mind your, your audience when you're you know, preparing those two different things, OK? So <clears throat> that's, that's the first thing is you have to identify your process. And then uh, if we were to go on to look at part A, right? So if you go out on Canvas, there is this document that talks about, OK, well, we want to make sure that you identify the goal of your clients. And one of the things I've done is I've added over in the comments on the right-hand side some things that I end up kind of speaking to when I talk to students about their project. So it's hard to read here. So I'm going to go ahead and blow it up, and we'll just look at the comment part of it. So what we know is the goal is defined by Eli Goldratt uh, from the novel, provides a very clear expectation of the goal for of for-profit companies, okay? So you should know by now, what does he say that the goal of for-profit <coughs> companies is? To make money, right? And so when you frame your answer to this part, you're going to be saying how implementing this project is going to help your client make money, <coughs> right? So if it's a for-profit company, that's what you're going to be dealing with. How do I frame what I'm doing to say, Here's why it matters, because it's going to help my client. They're going to be able to make money if we do this more efficiently, you know, that type of a thing. It's not as clear, maybe, if it's a not-for-profit company or non-profit company, right? And so we've sort of made our own um, in this class to say that's about utilizing your resources in the most efficient way possible so you can serve more people, right? That would sort of be for a non-profit organization, okay? Um, so... Again, I've tried to make some notes, and, and I'm not going to go through step by step on part A because that's what I'll do on that day one after the exam. We'll go through step by step. But these documents are out on Canvas already, so you can you know, be looking ahead here. You might want to print them out, just have those handy. Um, and so let me go ahead and bring up an example of one uh, of a project that's been done. And it won't match exactly with the criteria that you've got because it's been modified over uh, over time, but um, let's go ahead, I didn't really want that one, let's do this debriefing project. Okay, so we had, uh, again, uh, a woman that worked at uh, Transpapa Logistics, okay? And so, you know, they have this driver check-in process that was messy, and um, they had problems with it. So kind of her current, her first overview was, okay, well, here are the different steps that come into, come into play, right? And um, so the triangles are the waiting time and the... The squares are her first kind of blush at the activity steps, okay? <coughs> um, and you'll note, she says, the goal of the company is to make money. This project contributes to this goal by reducing the debriefing time for returning drivers and standardizing the debriefing process, etc. right? The flow unit is. The other thing that I want to be clear, when you write the paper for me, you're not doing creative writing. This is business report writing. Mm -hmm. Make it clear to me where this is A, this is B, this is C. I don't, I'm not looking for uh, four paragraphs on it. I just want you to kink, kink, and kink so that I can move through it and go, yep, 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 
we're in agreement. So I'm not looking for, again, a creative writing paper or um, one of the differences between this type of writing and creative writing is um, in creative writing, you try not to call the, something the same thing every time. Yeah, in this writing, you call it the same thing every time, right? Because then I'm not like, <clears throat> well, is that this, right? No, I just, you, you, you label it, define it, and that's what it is all the way throughout your paper. Okay, and so these, I posted these out here so you can kind of go look at these projects too, but let's just kind of scroll through. So you can see that's kind of, and I'm good with you, you know, part A, one, two, three, you know, part, or part, yeah, A, B, C, D, if we've got them labeled that way. And then here's kind of her next, okay, well then the next piece of it is wait time for drivers. Then she creates this table, which is what we're going to learn how to do today and Thursday. Where does this table come from? Okay, and again, she adds more to it, okay. She does a flow time analysis, and then she does a precedence diagram. And you can see now the detail that she's got in terms of she's looked at the steps that occur in each of those processes and the different choices, right? And so, again, you start out, I'm looking at this, and then you get into the detail, and you're gonna, your diagram's going to transition into something that's going to be more specific. And now there's not enough room to label each step, and I'm perfectly fine this, with this. So then what she does is um, you can see here are the, the, the steps as they're labeled, right? Okay? And then there's... Um, a section in there where it, where it asks on, so we kind of work this at a chapter at a time. So we're going to finish chapter three. You're going to do your chapter three exam. That way I think you should have a pretty good understanding of the theoretical side of it. Then we're going to apply chapter three to the practical side of it to your project. Okay. At the end of chapters three, four, and five, there are these sections called levers for managing, and in this case it's theoretical flow time. Okay. I expect you to go out and identify all of those levers and address how they apply to your project or if they don't, why you think they don't. So, that, so it's not go out and pick two of the eight. It's list the eight and specifically say this applies or this doesn't apply. And I'll give you some feedback <clears throat> to say, yep, I agree or no, I think here's how this could apply to your project. Okay. So again, it's pretty um, that, that Excel sheet that has kind of the steps on it is pretty specific in terms of how I want you to go through it. But these, again, this project is a good example of that. So she had some sub-process analysis that she needed to do, right? And so think about this. She created this across the entire semester. So she didn't come up with this, you know, like part A is probably going to be a one or two page document. And then kind of every time you add to it, you're going to add another page or two to it, okay? <coughs> Um, and here's where she's giving me the assumptions. Okay, now I'm describing why I, why I calculated it the way I did. So be sure that you give me the assumptions of, how, of why you calculated things the way that you did. Okay? And so again, again, levers for throughput. So I don't, I'm not going to go through that, but that kind of gives you this overview and how we're going to build it kind of a step at a time. Okay? So... Um, if we were to come back then just for part A, what we're going to hit next week is <clears throat> we're going to identify the goal of your client. We're going to identify what your specific flow unit is or flow units. Maybe you need to do both people and paperwork, right? Or maybe you need to do, do both people and inventory, okay? Um, and then identify the boundaries of your process. Where does it start and stop? Map it at a high level, and then it needs to be um, a cohesive professional document, meaning no spelling errors and organized in a way that uh, if you were submitting it to a supervisor that you would be proud of the work that you submitted, okay? So that kind of uh, gives us that, that overview. I'm not going to go through B, C, and D. They're all out there, so I think that um, because I think we can get too far ahead of ourselves. I don't want it to be overwhelming. We're just going to do a chunk at a time, So and it's going to flow Chapter 3, Project over chapter three, chapter four, project over chapter four, chapter five, project over chapter five. Okay, so we'll just kind of work through it a piece at a time. All right. Um, any questions about the project? Okay. All right. Um, I wanted to take a quick look at the discussions on the homework, real quick. So are you kind of tracking? So three is a good example of how the homework's going to go. So um, we did it in class. Was it 
how difficult was it for you to finish outside of class? Pretty straightforward? Okay. And it should be that way. But it's the, it's the practice of it. I want you to at least practice what we do uh, once outside of class. So that being said, let's look at 2A. Um, and just generally speaking, uh, most people did pretty good with, with these. I just want to emphasize, especially in, in uh, the second part, 2A2, there, there isn't necessarily, there's, I think, better answers, but there wasn't necessarily a right and a wrong answer. And as long as people justified why they thought what they thought about a particular fl uh, flow. But, in, but be sure that you're answering, if somebody asks about the product attributes, make sure that you're answering in terms of the four product attributes that we talked about, right? Um, and so, because I had some people that answered, in, uh, online in particular, that then would answer instead of uh, response time, quality, um, product cost, and product variety, right? They would go off on a tangent about something else. That might be true, but it isn't. I mean, we're specifically asking about the product attributes that we studied in class, okay? So make sure that, that we do that. And then if we looked at the second one, which asked about um, which type of process would you use, right? Would you use a job shop or a flow shop, okay? Um, again, First off, you need to answer in those terms, job shop or flow shop. I had a couple that didn't do that. And then secondly, you know, think about what that, that means. And so, like I had one person answered, I think for the introductory stage it should be a flow shop, okay? And then their rationale was because if it's going to be a high volume product that we know that we're going to sell a lot of, we would move right into a flow shop, which is true, right? So that's not a wrong answer, right? But um, but generally speaking, we typically start out with smaller volumes. So our introductory stage is, is typically more of a job shop. And then in the growth stage, we're moving from, we try to move from a job shop to a flow shop, depending on the product. Maybe your market niche is never going to be where you're going to have high volumes, right? So then you would stay with the job shop approach. So this is, again, that it depends MBA answer, right? It depends on what the circumstances are. So if you justified it with the right circumstances, it's no problem, but you needed to make sure that, that you used some justification there, okay? Um, and then with the, the Chapter 3 homework, I think everybody did fine on that. I don't really feel like we need to walk through that. The only thing I would say is make sure that you use units of measure when you answer questions. Because on the exam, if I asked you for flow time and you answer two, I'm going to take off a point for not having the unit of measure. Because, it's, because if Abby answers um, two uh, people per hour and Miranda answers two hours, right? Miranda's going to get it right. You're going to get one point off. And if you answer and don't put a unit of measure, it's not fair to Abby that she gets a point off if you don't put anything. So I just, for consistency, I need you to be able to show that you understand the unit of measure that we're talking about. Okay? All right. Wildly exciting stuff. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead. Any, any other questions on the homework? Any questions on the homework? All right. I'm going to go ahead and open up the PowerPoint here for the second lecture. So you should have completed the first 10 chapters of the goal at this point. Um, and, and again, I'm a little more flexible on the due dates with that. It's important to me that you do that. Um, and I think it will help you with an understanding of both the course and your project. Um, we've already talked to, about the 3A homework. What we're going to cover today is how operational measures link to financial measures. Okay? And then we're going to talk about Little's Law with a linear process example. Okay? Um, and we're going to talk about a simple one and a multi-step one. And we're going to talk about how we use, we use financial statements to analyze. I think from a big picture perspective, that's like a huge um, 
if you're trying to look at different companies, um, that's a really an interesting approach to be able to assess those companies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in Chapter 3, uh, we looked at those three measures, right? Throughput, inventory, and flow time. Okay. Um, and we talked about a variety of ways that we can look at that, a variety of unit of measures. We talked about materials, we talked about customers, we talked about jobs, we talked about cash, right? Um, and we talked about accounts receivable, okay? Um, and so today we're going to take a look at how we can apply that Little's Law then to some actual linear processes, okay? All right. So how can operations help a company compete? Okay, so we have some um, changing sources of competitive advantage, right? So over time in the 1960s, you've all heard, you can have any color you want as long as it's black, right? And then we went to more focused factories in the mid-1960s where particular factories produced particular things. Then in the 70s, we moved into flexible factories and product variety and a car for every taste and purse, right? Um, and in the 80s, we moved into the quality movement here in the U.S., right? Quality is free. Um, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, we love your product, but where is it? So don't sell what you produce, produce what sells, kind of making that transition. Um, that quality movement was, so I was your age in that early 80s, right? So I'm moving out into the working world. And the transportation company that I'm working for, they do a quality program uh, based on... Um, now I'm going to draw a blank on what his name is. Um, but the quality is free. Crosby is the one that quality is free. And his point was that um, if you do it right the first time, it actually costs less to invest in doing it right the first time than it does to, A, pay for the repairs, and, B, because of the lost business that you have. Um, and so, you know, we had this whole mantra of walking around Burnham, quality is free, you know, let's get it, you know, right? And then our executive team, though, didn't want to spend any money on it. So you'd go, quality is free, we need to make sure that we do it right the first time. And in order to make sure we do it right the first time, we need to make sure that we have these pieces of equipment. Yeah, no, don't have any money for that, right? So there's this mismatch sometimes between, and that's and that's one of the challenges that you face and that why they say one of the most important things is your executive team has to be on board with that. So again, then we move into the 80s and 90s and we move into kind of the, um, you know, continuous improvement, lean flow. We need to produce what sells and we try not to have anything extra anywhere in the system. All right. And so how do we in an operations environment impact that? Okay. Because if we're trying to talk about economic value added, right, it's the difference between profit and our opportunity costs. When we measure our profit in terms of revenues minus costs, right? Everybody agree with that? That's what profit is, okay? And so from an operation standpoint, if we want to, in so what we're looking at over on the right is how can operations influence that? Well, um, we can either increase price, right? Or we can increase throughput, okay? we probably have more of an opportunity to impact it in operations by increasing throughput. And that's how we're going to increase our revenues. Okay. In terms of costs, okay, we say material, labor, energy, overhead are kind of the four categories that we're looking at. We can either reduce costs or we can improve quality. Okay. We just talked about how Crosby says, and I agree to a certain extent, that improving quality reduces costs. I think there's a point of diminishing returns where you can spend more on having better quality and it makes no difference to your customer. So I think that has to be balanced with what makes the most sense to your customer. Okay? And so that's how we would impact operationally, we would impact the costs. Okay? From um, the opportunity costs, we talk about capital invested, right? Um, so we can either reduce capital intensity or reduce inventory in the system. Okay? Reducing capital intensity says, and this is going to be some things, I had a young man on the phone talking to me about his project uh, that's an online student, and one of the first places he wanted to go was, well, we need to invest in better capital equipment. And I'll tell you, that's not where continuous improvement begins. Okay, It begins with looking at the process to say, where do we identify the waste, and we don't jump into, let's spend more capital. We jump into and say, what can we do with the process we currently have? 
and I will tell you, I have been on that boat several times where, well, we need uh, this new equipment, and actually when you start to look at the process as it exists, that isn't what you need. You need to fix the process that you currently have, and your capital equipment may be fine, right? But at the end of the day, once you analyze that, you will know whether or not by fixing the process that we currently have, does that resolve our issue, or do we have to do something else? So um, it's, it's about innovation before capital is, is really what you're looking at. Okay. Because that allows you to continue to be flexible. So you can reduce your capital intensity to um, for that capital invested, or you can reduce your inventory. Right? You can just have less invested. And some of the examples we're going to do today are going to demonstrate uh, how that inventory can make make a difference. All right. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> Gosh. Have we heard these before, right? What are our flow time, throughput, inventory, process cost, and quality, okay? Um, and again, I could define them, but I feel like you've heard me define them probably nine times each. So just know that there are definitions for those, and I expect you to know them, okay? Um, and so now we're going to get our first look at the linear <coughs> process, right? And by a linear process, I'm just saying that every flow unit that enters this process goes through every step that's there, okay? And so our example is we have a hospital emergency room. Patients come in at the rate of 20 per hour. And on average, are processed at that rate as well. They wait in queue until they are called in for registration. And after registration, patients are taken to an inner area where they are assigned a bed and where they wait until an intern is ready to see them. Okay? On average, it's found that there are 30 patients waiting for registration and another 20 waiting to be seen by an intern. And on average, it takes a quarter of an hour in the registration process and three quarters of an hour with the intern. Okay? And so basically what we're going to do is we're going to transfer that information into a table. All right? And so for the problems that you do, um, and our text doesn't necessarily, this is my approach to it, and the one that I have found in terms of teaching has worked the best over the last five or six years is create the table, put the steps down the left-hand side of it, and make your three columns across the top, inventory, throughput, and flow time. And do them in the same way every time, so that inventory is always first, throughput's in the middle, and flow time is on the end. Okay. And then all I've done is I've drawn on the diagram, right, I've written on the diagram, okay, well, we have 20 patients waiting, right, in buffer one. I've said it takes a quarter of an hour in terms of time to register. We have 30 patients waiting in buffer two, <clears throat> and it's an intern. Uh, that step takes three quarters of an hour. <coughs> and then, if you'll note, on the left-hand side at the top, we say 20 patients per hour. Is that inventory, throughput, or flow time? <coughs> throughput. Throughput, because it's patients per hour, right? And so <coughs> your throughput typically is drawn on the arrows, okay? So you're just kind of representing that, and because this is a, a linear process, we assume it's the same across every arrow. We don't have to redraw it on every arrow. But what we're saying is that that's how many are going through that process is 20 patients per hour, okay? And so, <coughs> um, so now we've set up our table, right? We've got our, our steps on the left-hand column. We've got inventory throughput and flow time across the top, right? Um, and so another thing to kind of um, be aware of is that the three-column approach works as long as your throughput and your flow time are in the same unit of measure, okay? If they're not in the same unit of measure, let's say flow time was in minutes, I would add another column to convert my throughput from throughput per hour to throughput per minute. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at a pretty simple example. And so we're going to take the information that we know, and we're going to put it into the table. Okay, and so now I know that I have 20 patients waiting at buffer 1, 30 patients waiting at buffer 2. I know that my throughput is 20 patients per hour across every step, right? And I know that my flow time with um, registration is a quarter of an hour, and my flow time with the intern is three quarters of an hour. So if you note, we've got two of the three pieces of information for Little's Law, right? So now I can calculate the third. And the reason I set it up that way is 
And almost every problem you're going to be given in this class, you're going to have two of the three pieces of information. So if you get done and you're missing something, you may want to go back and look at the problem. Okay? It's almost easier in most cases that you take a snapshot of your inventory at those buffers. You think about that. You can walk to a waiting room and you can count how many people are in the waiting room. right? And you can do that 10 times across 10 days and average that, and that can be your, your average buffer. It's a pretty easy approach. It's a lot less, <coughs> I should say, it's a lot more difficult to take that approach at an activity. It's easier to time the activity, right? So in most cases, in buffers, you're going to have the snapshot of inventory, and in activity steps, you're going to have the, the timings that you're doing, right? And your throughput is just you know based on the process how many people are going. So we almost always have information for throughput. And then it's do we have inventory or do we have timing? Right? And so as you do your project, you're going to have to assess what's the best way to get that information. Um, almost always it's like this. The exception to that is if somebody's got a process that's really paperwork intensive, and then we just slap a sheet on the front of it, and you just track the time that it goes from one step to another. Okay? But <clears throat> All right, so again, let's work our way through the, this easy version. Now we want to do the math, right? And so the math says... Inventory is equal to throughput times flow time. So my inventory at registration is 5. Okay. At the intern, it's 20 times, again, throughput times flow time, so 15. <clears throat> and so now when I'm asked, well, how many people on average are in this process, because it's a linear process, I can sum up the inventory across those steps. right? And I know that I have 70 people. In, inside that process on average. Okay? To get to flow time, right? And I again I almost set my I almost always set my table up this way. So right underneath inventory, I put the formula for inventory. Right? Right underneath throughput, we don't really need it because that we have it, but and then right underneath flow time is inventory divided by throughput. So 20 divided by 20 is one hour in the buffer. A quarter of an hour at registration is given to us. 30 divided by 20 is an hour and a half at buffer two. Three quarters of an hour with the intern gives us three and a half hours total that somebody's in the process. Okay? <clears throat> so again, today we're just dealing with a linear process. And in a linear process, you can sum time and patience, okay? To get your total inside the process. In a nonlinear process, we have to take a slightly different approach. Okay? All right. So here's our second example. Um, and so we basically um, have patient check-in, wait, initial doctor consultation, doctor requests tests for the patients, they wait, and then the nurse takes the test, right? So each of these represents a step in the process. So when we make our table, those are going to be down the left-hand side. We have inventory throughput flow time across the top. And it looks like this, right? We know that we have four patients per hour across every step in the process. I know that I have two patients waiting here, one patient waiting here, and I have the times, right? And now I again can use Little's Law <coughs> and do the calculations. So just to be clear, in this example, what's the flow unit that we're talking about? Patient. Patient, right? And so our throughput is in what unit of measure? Patients. Patients per hour, and our time is in? Okay. So that would indicate that we have to do another column, right, where we convert our throughput into patients per minute. So then we just continue on with using Little's Law. We take 5 times the 0 0.0667 patients per minute. Okay. Is everybody tracking with that? I don't really feel like I have to go through every step on the table with you. I think, um, again, it's the same concept. It's just a different unit of measure. Um, so, again, you know we have two of the three pieces of information. Um, we use Little's Law to calculate the open cells. Uh, then once we have the open cells... Uh, for inventory throughput and flow time, we can speak about the entire process in terms of inventory throughput and flow time. 
Okay. So for the entire process, right, it says that we have 6.5 patients, right? If we took a snapshot of inventory in that process, on average, we're going to have six and a half patients in there. Okay. Uh, we have four patients per hour, and it takes on average 96.97 minutes for someone to, once they start the process, for the time that they exit the process, okay? All right. So that's your basic linear process flow, okay? All right. So we can also use this uh, business process flow paradigm to analyze financial flows, and we need three pieces of, uh, or we need three financial statements in order to do that. We need an income statement, we need a balance sheet, and we need a detailed cost of goods sold, okay? And so if you think about most publicly traded companies, you can go get that information, right? And so um, that being said, um, we're going to make some assumptions. Uh, all values are going to be in millions of dollars. Um, all right. So we want to determine how long it takes for a cost dollar. So when I spend a dollar... How long does it take for it to be transformed into revenue for the organization? So if we're going to talk about that, we have to understand our cash flows, okay? And so um, you can think, well, I have to buy raw material or I have to buy materials, right? And then um, what other things, what other costs do we have when we go into making something? For the material and what else? Labor. Labor, right? So we have to know our labor dollars. We have to know our raw material dollars. Um, and um, we have to think about from the time that we first purchase them, right, which is going to be our accounts receivable, then there's the time that we, they're in production, right, and then there's the time that we, um, that we're, sorry, I did that wrong. There's the time that we purchase our raw materials, and that's accounts payable, right? So I order my raw materials, but I haven't paid for them yet, right? So I can, so I've got this time from when I actually get my raw materials to when I pay for them. That's my accounts payable. I have our production, right? And then I have we sell it to our customer, and we're waiting for our customer to pay us. So that's our accounts receivable portion. So we've got kind of these three pieces of this financial flow, okay? So to kind of dive into that. Okay, so we've got our uh, inventory and cost of goods sold, all right? So our inventory, we're, we're building these sheds as our example, okay? So we have our raw materials, we have our fabrication work in process, we have our purchase parts for the base, we have our assembly work in process, we have our finished goods, and we have our total, okay? So, and then we have our cost of the goods sold, okay? And again, we have material, <coughs> fabrication, labor, and overhead, purchase parts, assembly, labor, and overhead. So is inventory, is it a snapshot in time, or is it a across the entire year type of number? Do you know? So Abby, when you do inventory at your facility, right, when you calculate that inventory, is it that snapshot in time, or are you summing up inventory across the entire year? It's just what we have at that time. Right. So, and that's and that's how inventory works. So it's just a snapshot in time. So those inventory dollars can represent a snapshot in time of what we have. And basically, most companies say when I do that inventory, we're going to assume that that's a good representation of what we have on hand the entire year. Cost of goods sold, is it a snapshot in time or is it dollars across the time period? Across the time period? It's across the time period. So inventory dollars work good for inventory in our Little's Law. Cost of goods sold dollars work good for throughput because it's dollars per year, right? So again, that's how we kind of transition. How can we use Little's Law, all right? So again, inventory works for inventory dollars and cost of goods sold works for our throughput, okay? So again, if we're interested in how do we determine how long our cost dollars spend in our system, right? 
I can look at this and say, well, the blue arrows are my inputs into the system, the throughputs that we've got. And it said that we have raw materials and parts, right? So we had 50.1 million per year and 40.2 million per year. Okay. So, again, uh, raw materials. Uh, again, we're talking about throughput. So 50.1, right, and 40.2 is our throughput. They're here. Okay. Our inventories are 50.6 million. That's our snapshot of what we have at any given time. Okay. And then our throughput in, in terms of labor and overhead, right, comes back here from <coughs> our 60.2 for fabrication and our 25.3 for assembly. So now, sorry. Now we're able to see, okay, we've got these inputs, right, which total, th that throughput totals 175.8 million per year. So that's all four of these summed up. That's the output in terms of cost dollars. And our inventories are 50.6 million. So if I need to know how much time, I can take inventory divided by throughput, and I can take 50.6 million dollars and divide it by 175.8 million dollars per year, Right? And that's going to tell me 0.288 of a year, which doesn't have much meaning to us. So if I say 52 weeks, I can convert that, and it's going to be 14.97 weeks. Okay? I thought that was on the slide, but it's not. So I'll. So in other words, the average dollar invested in the factory spends roughly 15 weeks before it leaves the process through the door of finished goods. Okay. Or on average, it takes 14.97 weeks for a dollar invested in the factory to be billed to a customer. Okay. In terms of cash flow, <clears throat> that's not all that happens, right? Because we have our accounts payable and our accounts receivable. So we have to address those. Okay. So let's look at how we would do that. Right? So here we have our consolidated statement of income and retained earnings. Okay. So um, from the income statement... Uh, let's see, you should be able to find, think about it from a bigger picture, I should be able to find my throughput for accounts receivable. What would my throughput in a given year be for my accounts receivable? So throughput for accounts receivable. Accounts receivable is what I'm billing to the customer, right? So what am I billing <coughs> to the customer off of this income statement? Look high. What are we <coughs> billing to the customer? Sales. sales. Yeah, net sales, right? Those have to be billed to the customer in order for us to collect on them. So net sales represents my throughput because if I sell 250 million per year, that's how many dollars are going to go through my accounts receivable process. Everybody making that connection? Okay. So now that I've got my throughput, then I need to understand what my inventory of accounts receivable is. Okay. So if I needed to have my inventory um, of accounts receivable, Do you see that anywhere on here? Total assets. What's that? You like your total assets? Um, so total assets represents a whole plethora of things. Okay. So there's a line on, item on here that actually speak, speaks specifically to our accounts receivables. Be 27.9. Right. So I've got my receivables less allowances of uh, 0.7 million. So it's 27.9. So that's a snapshot, a balance sheet is a snapshot at a point in time of dollars in those accounts. And so again, we would assume <coughs> that the 27.9 represents what we have in there on average. Okay. So um, <clears throat> now I've got my net sales is my throughput for my accounts receivable, and off of the balance sheet, my receivables of 27.9 represents my inventory. Okay. And then we need to also look at accounts payable, all right? And so um, uh, 
feel like this is a little bit out of order here. Um, so if we have inventory for both accounts receivable and accounts payable, okay, because again, payables is on the bottom of this balance sheet too, right? So I've got a receivables of 27.9 and a payable of 11.9, okay? Um, and so we've talked about that inventory is a snapshot value or total value. So inventory is a snapshot value and cost of goods sold is a value that runs across the year. So um, snapshots we call inventory in Little's Law and cost of goods sold across time is a throughput. Okay. So what I can do then is I can calculate a flow time for my accounts receivable. Right? And we said our throughput is $250 million per year. We have a snapshot of inventory of $27.9 million. So my flow time is going to be 0.112 of a year, which doesn't, again, if you told me that as a client, I would be like, what's 0.112 of a year? So we convert it into weeks times 52 weeks. tells us that we have <coughs> um, a dollar sits in, in, in accounts receivable on average for 5.8 weeks. Okay. For accounts payable, okay, we know that we have 90.3 million. Okay, we didn't really. Let's go back to where does that come from, right? Okay. Well, if we were saying we have to pay for our raw materials of 50.1, and we have to pay for our purchase parts of 40.2, those are payables, and so that's something that we're going to owe someone over time. The labor we accounted for in our um, production piece of it, but we didn't account for the accounts payable portion of it. Okay, so the 90.3 million in terms of our throughput, our 11.9 million in accounts payable, right? And so that tells me then 0.132 of a year or 6.9 weeks. So <clears throat> what we know is we have, when we purchase parts, right? We have 6.9 weeks from the time that we purchase the parts before we pay the vendor. Okay, then it's in production for 14.97 weeks, and then we bill the customer, but we don't. We send it to the customer and bill the customer, but we don't get paid for 5.8 weeks. Okay, so if we're interested in how that works, our cash to cash cycle is what we call that is 15 weeks in production plus 5.8 weeks where we bill, but we don't get paid, but we get the 6.9 week benefit from when we get the parts, but we don't pay our vendors. <coughs> so our cash to cash cycle time is 14.1 weeks, right? So cash to cash is the production plus the accounts receivable minus the accounts payable. <coughs> it's kind of interesting to see um, how this can make a difference. Now, this is an older chart. It's from 2000. Um, but if you look at best in class for farmers and chemicals, right, cash to cash cycle time is 31.3 in days, 31.3 days. The average is 120.2, right? Think about what a difference that can make in your cash flow and in your business, right? Uh, computers, best in class 27.5, average 62.1. Uh, consumer packaged goods, 19.9 days versus 77 days. Um, so again, if you if you're trying to identify where you might have some opportunity in your company, you could calculate your cash to cash and then compare it to what what happens in the industry. Okay. Um, so again, those things uh, it does matter, and so we're going to take a look at maybe how can we um, target some improvements by looking at some detailed financial flow analysis. Okay, so using the information we have, we can make some informed decisions about where to target our efforts. Okay, and so if I were going to draw that <coughs> business process flow, right, here's our uh, roofing, right, and here's our bases. So here's our uh, purchase parts for roofing, purchase parts for bases. That's our input into the process. Then we have our raw materials, right, we have our actual inventory of those. And then we have our throughput of labor that comes into play. Okay? And so all we've done is taken that information from those financial statements and we've mapped it out. Okay? Um, and so I can then transition that into our chart.
right? So our steps are we've got raw materials, fabrication, purchase, price, <coughs> assembly, finished goods, accounts receivable. <coughs> we know what our inventory dollars are, we know what our throughput is, and we know what our flow time is. And we've calculated that individually, but this is just kind of a summary of that, right? Now what the question becomes, well, if I were trying to make this process better, you know, if I said we've got a problem, where would you think that we should take a look to see if we could make some improvements? What categories do you think would make the most sense to look at first? Purchasing parts, the flow time. Okay, because that is the longest flow time. We have 11.12 weeks there, right? And I would agree that that's a place that we could look, okay? Um, and the other place that I would suggest is in your accounts receivable, okay? Because I think you want to look at it from two standpoints. 11.12 weeks, I'm betting there's some low-hanging fruit there, okay? And when you're working on process improvement, going after the low-hanging fruit, that's an easy, quick win, okay? Because that's a lot of time, and so how can we, how can we make that better? But it's 0.77 million per week, right? If I look at accounts receivable, it's 4.81 million per week. So if I could improve my accounts receivable by one week, I would free up 4.8 million in cash for my business. And I would have to improve the purchase parts by more than four weeks in order to get there, right? However, I might have that opportunity because it's got 11 weeks. So you'd have to look at both of those and kind of say, okay, where do we think we can hit that, okay? But that's how, so do you see how we can, we can take that information that we walk through those financial statements and come mm. back to this and go, okay, from a strategic standpoint, I'm going to talk to my accounts receivable team and we're going to understand our process for collection and figure out what we're going to do differently, okay? Or I'm going to talk to, um, you know, my purchase parts and I'm going to look at that part of the process and see how can I, how can I improve that process. And then they, I think your text does a, an interesting job of transitioning that into this picture, right? So if you're trying to explain this to someone, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? So we've got time across the bottom and we've got uh, dollars uh, going up the, the y-axis. And so it's very clear purchase parts has the longest amount of time. But if you look at the flow rate in dollars per week, accounts receivable has the biggest chunk there. And so again, those would be the two pieces that we would probably focus on. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So notes that I had. We can take the table and convert it to a chart, which reflects flow time in weeks on the x-axis and for rate in the dollars per week on the y-axis. That visual model makes it easier to see and communicate. Okay. Uh, Flow time in each department represents the amount of time a cost dollar spends on average in that department, okay? And working capital in each department includes the amount of inventory in it, okay? All right. So again, I think that's a, a really, for me, that's a very interesting and strategic example. I mean, it's a way that we can use this uh, process flow, Little's Law, um, to uh, get to some strategic decision making. All right, um, so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of example problems. Um, so problem 3.3 three from the text on page 76. So we have checking accounts at a local bank carry an average balance of $3,000, okay? The bank turns over its balance six times per year. On average, how many dollars flow through the bank each month, okay? So what's it asking us to solve for? On average, how many dollars flow through the bank each month? Are we being asked to solve for inventory, throughput, or flow time? Throughput. Throughput, right? And so what information do we have from the example? <clears throat> if we're trying to solve for throughput, what other two pieces of information should we be looking for is another way to phrase that. Inventory and flow time. Right. So we know then our inventory is what? 3,000. 3,000. And our flow time, it's a little twisty in this one, but what, what do you think our flow time is? The bank turns over its balance six times per year. Okay. One of the ways that we'd get there is to <coughs> say, all right, well, then it's one-sixth of a year is what our flow time is, and so it would be two months. Okay. 
right now that I know that I have inventory dollars of three thousand and two months of flow time get my throughput is going to be fifteen hundred dollars per month because it's going to be inventory divided by flow time okay all right uh, problem 311 from page 78 of the text ABC Corporation's consolidated income statement and balance sheet for years 2011 and 2012 are shown on the next slide. Okay, how do you think cash flow performance in 2011 compares with that of 2012 in the, in the factory as well as in accounts receivable? So basically from the problem, it's asking us to look at factory cash flow and accounts receivable cash flow for year 2011 and for year 2012. Okay. So, the information that we're given is our net revenues, our costs of goods sold, um, our cash, our inventories, and our accounts receivable. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> if I were going to um, calculate factory flow time, and I wanted, so we know that flow time is inventory divided by throughput. Okay. So do, do you recall where we get the inventory and the throughput? Let's just look at 2011. Is my, is my throughput going to be, so you can tell kind of by the unit of measure. I've got 99,621 per year or 97,380. Which one is going to, which one of those would be my throughput for the factory? What's that? That would be the net revenues. So the net revenues is going to be in sales dollars, right? And the cost of goods sold is going to be in cost dollars. So I'd probably use the cost dollars. So I'd use the cost of goods sold. Okay? Um, and so, and then what's my inventory going to be for 2011? The 20,000. Yeah, the 20,880. So I'm going to take 20,880 and divide it by the 97,380. And that's going to tell me uh, that it's 0.2144 of a year. All right? Troy, I'm going to pick on you. So now I want to do accounts receivable for 2011. What am I going to do use for my inventory for accounts receivable? The 21,596. Right. And what am I going to use for my throughput? Revenues. Yep. I'm going to use my net revenues. So I'm going to divide 21,596 by the 99,621. So, and that's going to come back at 0.2168 of a year. Okay. Then in 2012, Julie, if I wanted to do my factory flow time for 2012, what am I going to use for um, my inventory? Um, 25,200. Right. And what am I going to use for my throughput? 98,350. 98,350, my cost of goods sold. Okay. And so that's going to tell me that my factory flow time is 0.2562. So in 2011, my factory flow time was 0 .211, 0 0.21 of a year. And in 2012, it's 0 0.26 of a year. So we improved or disimproved from 2011 to 2012 in factory flow time. Unimproved. What's that? Unimproved or disimproved? Disimproved. Yep, unimproved. Gotten worse. However, we want to phrase that, right? Okay. So our factory flow time has actually gotten worse. Our accounts receivable, then, Miranda, how am I calculating uh, accounts receivable for 2012? Um, it would be the 22,872 would be your inventory. Right. And then, um, you'd use the, maybe the 98, or no, you'd use the revenues, so 110. Yeah, you'd use the revenue, so the 110,644. And when I divide that out, it's 0 .2067. So my accounts receivable has actually improved from <coughs> 0 0.22 to 0 0.21, okay? And sometimes it's kind of interesting, um, you know, if we're, it's easy sometimes to jump on a bandwagon and, ba and blame a particular area for a particular problem and being able to break it down into its component parts here and identify what the flow time 
through each of those component parts can actually uh, maybe tell a different story than what people are assuming. Okay. So overall, net income is increased so that at the aggregate corporate level, we have an improvement. But based on these calculations, should we focus on our accounts receivable collections or our factory flow time? That's easy. We should focus on the factory flow time, right? Accounts receivable did not get any better. Okay? All right. So that does it for today's lecture. Um, and it's going to, again, I think, just kind of keep in mind, you may want to go back and refer to the examples in the textbook to kind of get your head around when you, those, those uh, different pieces that come from the different financial statements. But I think remember them in terms of, um, is it a snapshot in time or is it dollars across time, right? And the snapshot in time represents inventory in Little's Law and dollars across time represents the throughput in Little's Law. Abby, you look excited. Yes. I'm so confused. Are you confused? Do you want me to do another one? <laughs> I That one was just really fast, and I just was really lost. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at it again. Okay. <laughs> no problem. And it might help if I... Um, if I let me try to write on here. That sometimes can get interesting. Okay. So basically, if I'm trying to do my factory flow, and I'm going to abbreviate that to FF because for me to write that out, it looks like FP, but it's actually FF, right? So if I were going to do my factory flow, and I'm interested in the time for 2011, I need my um, inventory divided by my throughput, right? And when we talk about factory, right, here's our inventory, okay? And when we talk about factory, we're dealing in cost dollars. <coughs> so we need to use the cost of goods sold. Uh, so, what's the difference between the two of those? Between net revenues and cost of yeah. goods sold? So, for example, when I buy from my vendor, I'm just paying for the cost of the product. When I'm... My revenue represents what I'm billing my customer. Okay. So it's going to include profits in there too, right? And my cost dollars don't include the profit. It just is, this is what it costs me, okay? So for my factory flow, then I'm going to take this um, inventory divided by this throughput for 2011. If it's all right with you, we're just going to, I'm going to skip right to the calculation here, which is going to be then... Uh, 0.2144 years. Okay. If I'm going to do that same thing for 2012, it's going to be the inventory, right, of 25,200 divided by the throughput of 98,350 per year. And that's going to be 0.25 six two <coughs> a year. Okay? And so we have gotten worse. With our factory flow time. Okay? If I were going to look at my accounts receivable, right? Here's my AR inventory. And because this is this is in accounts receivable is what I'm billing to the customer, so it's not in cost dollars. It includes the profits, right? And so I want to include my net revenues as my throughput for AR because we're going to be billing all of that to our customers across the year, okay? So for 2011, that becomes then... The 21,596 divided by 99,621, which is 0.2168 years. And for 2012, 
it is 22,872 divided by 110,644, and that is 0 0.2067 years. So our time for accounts receivable, right, has gotten better. Okay. Sorry. And you know what? That's perfect because I'm sure if you had questions, there's going to be other people that had questions and weren't tracking with it, and especially online because I think sometimes it's easier to track when you're right here face to face too. So don't ever be afraid to go time out. It's just really fast, and I couldn't write down numbers. Like okay, and that's and that, yeah. So and I'll try to be better about that because that was I was just kind of reading the results off the slide. The other thing sometimes can happen if I'm working in Excel. Sometimes that goes faster than what you can write, and don't be afraid to say, "I need wait, I need you to slow down." Okay, because we clearly have time. So, okay. So then, like as like a final answer, um, like was 2012 better? Like since that was each one of each. So, so the answer is you have to break it down into its components. So the accounts receivable flow time is actually better. The factory flow time is actually worse. So if you were asked where do you need to focus for improvements, you would say, well, our factory flow time got worse. We need to probably dive into that and figure out what we're going to do there. Okay. So it says, do you think 2012 is an overall improvement? Like, would you say that it was? So I just so so here's the thing about this textbook is just because it asks a yes or no question doesn't mean it's a yes or no okay. answer. So the answer is it was an improvement in accounts receivable, but it was a disimprovement in the factory flow. Okay, and that's the thing you're kind of moving into. And this textbook in particular, it has the MBA kind of twisty turn stuff in it. So it's which is partly why I've written my own homework for it so that you go online and you do exactly what we do in class. If you look at the problems that are in the back of the chapter, we can do them. <coughs> None of them are exactly like the examples that are in the textbook or that we do in class. And so I'll use them sometimes as, an, as a further example, but I typically don't use them in the first lecture or two because they always add something that requires you to pull from your overall understanding of you know, these financial statements. Or And so I want to make sure I have a chance to walk through those. So, okay. All right. Do you think about your project? And, um, and again, don't be afraid to swing by if you want to talk about that. Other than that, I'll see you back here on Thursday.